Good morning, everyone. This ex parte urgent application hearing is in the matter of case number CFI 060-2023 and is being held by way of video conference before Justice Sir Jeremy Cook appearing from London. Any orders or directions made during or after the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instructions. The, applic the applicants are represented by Reed Smith LLP. Lead counsel is Ms. Antonia Bird. Will the judge and the party's representative please confirm that the situation is as I have stated? Thank you. Ms. Antonia? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I confirm uh, from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Bird. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, on behalf of the applicant AES Middle East Insurance uh, Broker LLC, we are seeking your order today for an interim injunction as set out in the draft order against the respondent GSB Capital Limited. Uh, as set out in the application, uh, four former employees of the applicant have taken the applicant's confidential information in breach of their employment contracts and provided it to the respondent. This matter against the former employees is being addressed separately in criminal and labor proceedings before UE courts. Here today, we are, uh, we are here to request an injunction relating to the respondent's misconduct, the respondent being the new employer of the former employees. Uh, and the respondent has also breached its obligations in this application therefore relates to that conduct, which we will discuss. Um, the respondent has, in short, obtained confidential information, which belongs to the applicant, and it is using this information to its commercial advantage and the harm and damage of the applicant. That's, in essence, what this, uh, this the main dispute will relate to. And in short, all we are asking today, as part of these interim measures proceedings, that an interim order is issued requiring the respondent to cease using our information and, and some related orders. If your honor allows and subject to any questions or comments, my plan for today was to uh, focus on seven issues in the order of our written submissions. First, very briefly, the court's jurisdiction. Second, very briefly, the court's right to order an interim injunction. Third, in some more detail that this issue is a serious issue to be tried. Fourth, that damages would not be an adequate remedy. Fifth, that the balance of convenience lies in favor of the applicant. Sixth, that the reasons uh, why this application has been made without notice are made out. And seventh, why this application is urgent. And as part of each of these seven points, I plan to address your honor uh, as part of our full and frank disclosure obligations on potential arguments the respondent may raise. And finally, uh, after addressing you on these seven points, I also have prepared to take your honor through the draft order we have uh, enclosed with our submissions. So unless your honor has any other um, questions or directions at this stage, um, I can go ahead. Well, the, the, the most obvious uh, question that you'll have to deal with at some point <coughs> is whether there should be an order for delivery up of the material on an ex parte basis, as opposed to merely negative orders, uh, which um, prevent them using the information that they've got uh, and preserving it. Um, <coughs> I assume that the ultimate result that you would wish to achieve is either delivery up of all hard copies and destruction of whatever they've got that's electronic. Um, but that would be a, a final injunction, not uh, a, an interlocutory one. But you need to be quite clear as to what it is you're really seeking for me today and what is possible uh, on an ex parte basis. The, uh, the other fact, Thank you for the, the, the other fact, other factor that I want you to deal with is the question of when um, <clears throat> Not, when the claimant first knew that there was a problem of this kind and therefore the delay in bringing this uh, application. Absolutely. I have prepared to address you on, on both of these points. I will try and uh, make the other points I wanted to make in, 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 uh, more briefly. 
since uh, I understand that these are the two focus points. But uh, if you allow me, I will go through the points in, in, in the order uh, I prepared in any case, but I will shorten the other aspects. Does that yes. work? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, really just uh, 10 seconds on jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of the court, of course, is established here under 5A1A uh, of the Judicial Authority Law because the respondent is a DFC licensed establishment and this is a commercial claim. So I will move yes. past jurisdiction. Uh, second point, again, uh, very briefly in terms of the very much established right of this court to order an injunction. We are relying on Article 22.2, uh, as well as Articles 32b and C of the DFC Court's law as the primary basis. And um, I will come back to these when I uh, discuss the order and especially the delivery up order, as you've noted. But um, of course, in general terms, uh, the uh, uh, Court's law allows for both prohibitory and mandatory injunctions. Uh, but I will come yes. back to this uh, once we look at the order um, in detail. Um, so uh, I will move past the other points on, on the uh, right of the court to grant an injunction since they are established. So moving to my third point, which is that there is a serious issue to be tried. The criteria for the injunction to be granted is uh, laid out in the American Cyanamide case. And uh, again, this authority has been regularly cited by this court, including in Suntec uh, versus Altamimi. So um, uh, we, are, we are relying on the test in that, uh, in that authority. Uh, and the first question for the court to be satisfied, of course, is that there's a serious question to be tried um, and the case is not frivolous or vexatious. Um, again, uh, in our submission, this can be uh, established very quickly on the basis of our existing submissions, but I did want to spend just a few minutes uh, showing to your honor uh, the, the basis for, at the very least, the primary cause of action. Um, the uh, uh, response or the applicant will be advancing free course of action in the merits proceedings against the respondent, and the primary is inducing or procuring a breach of a legal right. Uh, secondary being a local conspiracy, and third being breach of confidence. Um, and to be clear, if any of these causes of action alone is a serious issue to be tried, then the part this part of the test for the purposes of today's injunction is satisfied. So I wanted to focus briefly on the first course of action, which is uh, the test for inducing or procuring a breach of a legal right, which is set out under Article 32 of the Law of Obligations, uh, which is Law Number 5 uh, of 2005 of the DFC. The, the test uh, uh, split into four parts. First, it requires that the respondent knows that the former employees owe a legal obligation to the claimant. And here we say that that is clearly established. Uh, the respondent very much knew that the former employees owed confidentiality obligations to the applicant. This is clearly the case, not just because the respondent has similar obligations in its own contracts, but because there is in fact correspondence between the applicant and the respondent last year in August 22, uh, at which point the respondent confirmed that uh, it had not obtained any confidential information, that it did not uh, intend to uh, obtain such information. That was after the applicant informed the respondent that these confidentiality obligations existed. Uh, so the evidence for that is in the bundle six uh, Apologies, Your Honor. Is, is it sufficient if I refer to the reference with the CHC1? One six eight. What would you prefer? I've I've had to um, access this by being sent uh, the documents um, in a wee transfer. So um, probably the easiest thing to do is to refer to the page reference of each of the exhibits. And just just to be clear about this, um, all I've seen so far are two witness statements, one from Mr. Willen and one from Mr. Instone. Uh, and I've got the exhibits to those and a draft order, but I don't have uh, any draft claim form or particulars of claim, and I don't have uh, any skeleton argument. Is that what I should have? 
Uh, not not quite. We have, uh, on the instruction of the court, filed the skeleton together with the hearing bundle yesterday by 2 p.m. Uh, so I wonder whether the court may be able to share at least the bundle with your honor now, because, of course, that includes all the documents that I wanted to cite, including the authorities. And the, the skeleton, yes, uh, as, a, as the court directed, we filed it by 2 p.m. yesterday. Um, well, I don't have I, any of that. And I, I don't have access to the CMS bundle because, for reasons that entirely escaped me, um, I couldn't access it this morning. Um, it, it simply wouldn't recognise my username stroke password, which I have been using historically for I don't know how long. So I don't have access to the CMS bundle. Sorry about that. Um, I can, in terms of uh, the current purposes, I can refer to the original references. Um, if you could, that would help. Yes, that is that, that is not a problem. Um, as I say, the skeleton has been filed, and it would be a, it would be good if that could be put in front of you at the appropriate time. In front of your other questions, uh, in, sorry, in, in respect of your other questions, we have not filed the claim form for Part Seven. That is correct. What we have done in the orders, we have undertaken to file the Part Seven uh, claim form uh, within 24 hours of your order. Yes, I mean, that, that's a bit odd. I would have expected to have a draft claim form, even if it hadn't been issued. Do you have a draft uh, uh, at all as yet? Yes, I understand we do have a draft and uh, we are, uh, as I say, able to file it within 24 hours to, and we are also ready to pay the costs. Yes, all right. Well, you, you carry on telling me about the causes of action. Thank you. Um, so the emails to which I was referring to are originally included in uh, the JJW1 uh, uh, exhibit at page 109. Um, and in the new bundle, that will be page 168, just for the record. Um, so there were two emails there uh, uh, from the 11th of August 2022 in which the applicant and respondent correspondent regarding the uh, right of the applicant to its confidential information. So that establishes um, the first part of the test. The yeah. second part of the test requires there for the third parties, which is the former employees, to in, be in, in breach of their obligations. Um, of course, uh, the tort of procuring the breach is an accessory liability dependent on the primary wrong and here. The, the, the fact that the former employees have, in fact, committed breaches of their employment agreements is also, in our view, uh, undisputable on the evidence uh, already available. The confidentiality provisions um, are set out, for example, at clause 22 of Mr. Stuart Ritchie's contract, which is at bundle JJW1, page 17. Um, I uh, don't suggest to take you there, but um, uh, they have been summarized in the, the witness statement of JJW, where uh, we have identified the uh, provisions that uh, in perpetuity request the former employees to keep confidential information confidential, um, which is, of course, a straightforward uh, obligation. Uh, and as such, we say that the underlying breach um, uh, is, has clearly been made out. And I will I will take your honour to one email, which will show this in one second. Um, this is, of course, not the forum to consider the evidence in any detail, but I do think that there's one email that is worth looking at at this moment. And it also goes to one of the questions that your honour had uh, a moment ago. Uh, if I could please take you to uh, what used to be in the bundle at JJW1144, so page 144 in the uh, JJW exhibit. Yeah. Uh, so here we should have um, an email from Chris Jones, Wednesday, June 7, 2023. Do you have that, Yona? Yes. Yes. So this is this is uh, the the primary evidence that unequivocally confirms uh, that the confidential information of the applicant uh, was used by the former employees in breach of their agreements and used by the respondent. What you see here is um, a former client, uh, Chris Jones, emailing the applicant, AES International, Mickey Armstrong is one of the employees, on the 7th of June 23. Um, and uh, in the email, uh, Mr. Jones confirms 
that uh, due to no reflection of the outstanding service, he will be moving his business uh, to me. Uh, he says here that the savings in advisor and OCF charges are positive. Um, and uh, in response and out of courtesy to Sam Instance, who is the managing um, partner of the uh, applicant, he says, attached advisor proposal info. And if you move down to the advisor proposal info, you will see that uh, Mr. Jones copied and pasted parts of an email which he received from the respondent, uh, GSB. It's very clearly stated here that uh, GSB is the new, uh, new advisor. GSB's fees are on the right and red. Uh, the current situation uh, are the, uh, uh, is the confidential information of the applicant as the exact uh, information regarding the costs by the applicant. And you can see in uh, footnote um, three that um, the, sorry, it's the, actually it's the, just below footnote three, it says, please yes, note your existing product fees are taken from your old AES report. Yeah. That, yes, that sir. is the, that, that is the point at which um, the uh, applicant ha considered it had unequivocal evidence that both the former employees had breached their confidentiality obligations and it was now suffering loss because there were, there were now clients leaving that were confirming that they were leaving to GSB, but also that the respondent was clearly um, implicated in this uh, in this machination, and this is the moment. And I will come back to this when we speak about uh, urgency. This is the moment when um, the applicant decided to uh, reach out uh, to uh, external counsel to uh, get advice with respect to rights against the respondent. Um, so we'll come back to that. But um, this, uh, for the time being, establishes uh, the. Um, the, the, the breach, uh, which is the second uh, part of the test uh, for this particular cause of action. Um, and uh, we, uh, the third, so moving to the third part of the legal test, that requires that the respondent intentionally induces the former employees to breach the obligation. Um, it is uh, clear to the applicant, in light of all the evidence that the respondent did induce the former employees to bring the applicant's uh, confidential information. This is set out in JJW1 uh, at, par at uh, page 106. There are various examples of inducement, um, and I wanted to mention them briefly. Uh, first, of course, the respondent offered the former employees uh, promoted roles to come over, which you know, may of course be uh, uh, also considered as a uh, general uh, sort of offer that the respondent was making. But I think the second point is particularly important. The respondent appears to have offered 70% of fees for any clients which former employees would transfer. This is something that is currently uh, set out uh, in uh, JJW1 at page 106. And that refers to um, a, a document signed by one of the employees, one of the applicant's employees, following discussion with the uh, former employees. Of course, this is currently hearsay evidence, but uh, in due course, we would hope to adduce evidence on this point. The the third reason why we say there was inducement by the respondent is, uh, and again, this relies on uh, this hearsay evidence by Mr. Walsh. Um, is that uh, the respondent appears to have offered shareholding to one of the former employees uh, for moving the applicant's business. Um, and uh, we know as a fact, and that is in the bundle, that uh, one of the share employees in fact has shareholding uh, in the applicant. So that, uh, that has been confirmed. Um, and finally, the respondent the respondent's uh, involvement uh, and the various uh, uh, evidential points that made the applicant consider the respondent is, uh, was inducing the former employees is also that the respondent created this generic email address uh, for use of the confidential information. So rather than um, sort of awaiting for the former employees to be formally employed and being able to 
you know, do whatever they like, so to speak, with the information. The respondent specifically went ahead and created an email address, which was which could be used without signature by the former employees uh, prior to them being able to do this uh, in accordance with their, you know, employment obligations, uh, or at least that's that's the apparent reason for this email address being created. So in light of all of these facts, um, it is our position that the inducement part is also quite clearly made out, but although, although, of course, all we need to show for the time being that there's a serious uh, issue uh, here, uh, rather than um, convince you on the merits of this of this aspect. Um, and of course, we also note, uh, it is important for your honor to be in mind that the respondent has confirmed, uh, and I mentioned this document previously, to the applicant, uh, that it would not, uh, 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 that it doesn't have any confidential information, that it wasn't intending to have, have it, it, did not induce or encourage or incentivize the breach of the former employee's obligations. Uh, and yet the evidence really demonstrates that that is not the case. So we are dealing with a respondent here that has mm, deliberately misdirected the applicant last year and thereby uh, calmed the applicant's uh, concerns when they initially arose. Um, and fourth and finally, with respect to the test, uh, the test requires to show that the applicant is suffering loss as a result of the breach. Um, and we have, um, or even in the uh, evidence before you already in the two witness statements, uh, uh, submitted some detail with respect to the very significant financial, reputational and other losses. And, and uh, I will go through these uh, in a little bit more detail when we talk about damages not being um, not being adequate. Um, so as such, while we do not need to show anything more than that, that there is a serious issue, uh, the evidence that we have so far already demonstrates that we have very high probability of success in the upcoming uh, Part 7 proceedings. Um, so that's uh, on the first course of action. As part of our full and frank disclosure, we expect the respondent will argue the test is not satisfied, for example, because the inducement cannot be shown um, or for other reasons. Um, we don't think that this argument has X, but in any case, we don't think that this argument impacts the current assessment that the uh, that Your Honor needs to make with respect to the serious issue. And we rely here on uh, the authorities and Kane and Global Nature, uh, which will be in the hearing bundle. You don't have these at the moment, but they are in the hearing bundle um, at pages uh, 575 onwards. Um, and they uh, uh, very clearly uh, confirm the position in American sign uh, with respect to uh, this is what a serious issue uh, involves. And there it was said, uh, if the issue seems to be one that is not frivolous, in other words, is one for which they're supporting material, then I would conclude there's a tribal issue. And we say we are, we are, we are squarely within, within that, uh, within that uh, summary. Um, uh, one, yeah, one final point, I think I've already mentioned uh, that we are dealing with a respondent that has previously misdirected uh, the applicant. Um, and here we would also like to rely on the case uh, Lakatamia Shipping and Sue and others, which again, I apologize, you don't have it at the moment, but it is in the bundle uh, at uh, pages 739 onwards. And we are specifically referring to paragraph 66 at page 753, and there it was held that in deciding whether a serious allegation was established on the balance of probabilities, regard may be held to the fact that a party had lied or otherwise engaged in misconduct. So we do consider that that is important because we do have evidence that uh, we were deliberately misdirected. And as we've also put into uh, JJW at paragraph 43, uh, which is on page 23, um, there is uh, more conduct of the respondent that is worth noting at this stage. Um, we have described there that in January this year, the respondent shareholders uh, crafted a special purpose vehicle called Watnall for Marketing. This is in the exhibit uh, bundle at page 214. Um, this is an entity controlled by Ross Watnall, the founder of the respondent. And this entity was then used to grant a temporary work visa to Craig Ritchie, who is one of the four employees, in February 23. And we have evidence for that is also in JJW um, uh, at page 43. Uh, his work visa had not expired until May 23. And yet three months earlier, he was granted a visa by the respondent having created the special purpose vehicle. 
Um, it, it does appear that this was done to avoid potential risks of the UAE Ministry of Labor not permitting a visa for the uh, for, for this employee for a competitor of the applicant while there was still a labor dispute ongoing. Um, and we have referred there to Article 5 of uh, the ministerial decision in 47 2022 under the UAE labor law. Uh, the point we're trying to make here is that uh, the, the, the conduct of the respondent um, uh, needs to be taken into account uh, for various reasons as part of this injunction, including balance of probabilities, as we will come to later. Um, but uh, there, are, there are several aspects of the conduct that we wanted to make sure that Your Honor has, uh, has in mind when, when deciding this, this, uh, this, this injunction application. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I, I'm in your hands as to whether uh, Your Honor would be helped if I go through each part of the tests for the other two causes of action or if it is sufficient for the time being to move to my next point and jump over the conspiracy and um, a breach of confidence. Uh, because as I say, in our view, we only need to establish a serious issue with respect to one cause of action, and that is already sufficient uh, for current purposes. But I can go through the other causes of action briefly, if that would help. Well, I don't think there's any need because it's the same factual background and it's only a question of the legal framework uh, exactly. in terms of the wrongdoing. So I don't need that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, that's very helpful. In which case, I'll move to my point number four, which is that damages are not an adequate remedy. Again, we can probably deal with these quite quickly. Um, so please do tell me if I should uh, move even faster. But um, this is, of course, uh, uh, um, one of the uh, well, the second part of the American Sinami test, which is very well established. Um, and the court here will consider the availability of an uh, adequate remedy and damages, both to the applicant uh, and also, you know, in the balance of convenience, the, the court will consider that uh, to the respondent in the event the injunction was granted against it. Um, what we did want to point out uh, is, uh, yes, the Gemini and Julian Sawyer case, which uh, will be in your hearing bundle at uh, page uh, 604, paragraph 54. Um, we think that that includes a useful um, summary for our purposes of um, uh, w what it means, uh, whether there's an adequate remedy. In that case, it was said that uh, the court takes into account whether it would be possible to meaningfully quantify the losses arising. So we have relied on that language. And of course, in, in your own decisions in this court, you have previously referred to uh, hard to quantify. So meaningfully quantify or hard to quantify. That's uh, what we're looking at. Uh, we also refer to uh, the case, uh, your, your Honours case uh, in Sunrise, Brokers and Rogers, which is going to be in your bundle at page 663, uh, a matter which considered loss which an employer may suffer from an employee taking work with a competitor. Uh, so it's a simple, I should mention that most, uh, of, the, of the precedents before you relate to restrictive covenants. And of course, we are in a very different position here. We are not requesting uh, anything with respect to the former employees. This is a different scenario where we have claims against the respondent. But nonetheless, the uh, points relating to damages are very useful. Um, uh, Lord, sorry, it is not your case, apologies. Lord Underhill's case in Sunrise, Brokers and Rogers. Uh, Lord Underhill considered there uh, that there are evident and grave difficulties in assessing loss when an em employee moves to a competitor for the following three reasons. It was said it's difficult to identify which clients are transferring their business. Uh, even when that can be established, uh, there are issues around causation. And uh, even if that can be established, then there are difficulties around the length of the period for which the loss of the business could be said to be attributable to the uh, breach that occurred. So we say that we're in exactly that kind of situation uh, with respect to the losses, because first of all, at the moment, it's impossible for the applicant to know how many clients have transferred their business to the respondent. Second, even if disclosure eventually identifies uh, this number, there will certainly be arguments around causation. But while we say this issue is quite clear cut on the evidence that we've seen so far, um, in light of our full and frank disclosure obligations, we do expect the respondent will uh, disagree. Um, and in any case, this will present very serious difficulties in assessing the losses to 
exactly which client uh, moved for which reason. Um, and finally, uh, the issue uh, with respect to the period of the loss is also uh, absolutely clear because, of course, um, as we've already uh, put forward in the evidence before you, and that is, for example, in the JJW statement at paragraph uh, 41, um, we are, are, are the applicant considers that uh, the uh, clients are lifetime clients. Um, only 3% of the applicant's clients have ever left prior to this. So the applicant considers that there are up to 40 years of losses that are warranted. Again, we expect the respondent will disagree. Um, we expect that there's going to be a, a serious dispute with respect to the uh, quantum of the losses. And therefore, even potential losses that, that uh, the applicant is suffering, we say it is not possible to meaningfully quantify them, or uh, it will be hard to quantify them, depending on whichever interpretation you use. Okay. Um, but of course, in addition to the financial losses, we've also set out um, in JW at paragraph 52, uh, the various other losses that are being suffered, including reputational harm, harm with respect to the client's perception of the applicant's treatment of confidential information, harm with respect to the product providers dealing with the applicants, harm with respect to the employees that are seeing clients leave in troughs. Um, all of this adds to the difficulty to quantify, and therefore, um, in our view, it is um, absolutely clear that this part of the test is also satisfy, satisfied here. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we have put in the bundle, I'll just note this for when you do get the hearing bundle, we have put the Gemini case that I've mentioned already, which at um, page 603 is very relevant with respect to this. There's also the Tsoul case, Tsoul Medical versus Trial Bok, um, which is at the bundle at page 659, paragraphs 52 and 53, uh, which is also very much a point um, and uh, confirms that in the defendant's possession and that in that case, in the ongoing risk of misuse of that uh, the defendant's known conduct as shown by forensic analysis may be the tip of a much larger iceberg of wrongdoing. Uh, as counsel in the case admits. Uh, and the claimant's knowledge is necessarily limited given the defendant's wiping off the laptop. So in that situation, uh, which is very similar to, to ours, what the judge was saying that until the full extent of the defendant's wrongdoing is known, uh, this is not something that can be quantified. And we say that we are in a very, a very similar scenario uh, as that. And of course, um, you, uh, your Honour, has considered uh, this matter in Amira Foods and IDBI Bank, um, a different scenario, but a similar type of damage, including reputational damage, that your Honour considered um, was uh, something that could not or was, or was hard to, uh, to, to quantify, and hence an our submission would be not meaningfully quantified. Um, and uh, since in our submission, damages are very clearly not adequate. Uh, the court would then consider whether damages uh, would be adequate if the injunction was granted uh, wrongly. Um, so moving, um, mo moving the sort of straddles my fifth point with respect to the balance of uh, convenience. But uh, in terms of the damages to the respondent, in our, in our position, they would in fact be very much quantifiable because if uh, for whatever reason the injunction is granted wrongly and there's a period of time, let's say one year until the conclusion of the merits proceedings during which the respondent is unable to use our confidential information, then uh, that is a very short period of time. Uh, it is specific to particular clients. The timing is specific and none of the other reputational damages apply whatsoever that do not relate to the respondent. So in our view, the position is completely would suffer. Um, and that uh, brings me to my fifth point, balance of convenience. So unless Yona has any questions at this stage, I'll move to that. Uh, thank you. Um, so since we have a serious issue and there's a non-advocacy uh, adequacy of damages, uh, the court will then consider whether uh, where the balance of convenience lies. Um, and here we um, uh, are referring to uh, the Films Rover decision by Lord Hoffman, which is going to be in your bundle at page 703, uh, paragraph F, um, which, as your honour will be very familiar with, uh, sets out that uh, it is really uh, for the court to take whichever course appears to carry the lower risk of injustice. 
um, if it should turn out to have been wrong in the sense uh, described. So that's that's the framework that um, my submissions work towards. Um, as I've already addressed to you on on, uh, failing to grant the injunction is likely to lead to very significant damage for the applicant um, that have been set out earlier. Uh, and we, we, we are not, uh, we will come to the order shortly, but in, in essence, we are not asking for much. And in fact, all we want to stop, and we, I will explain to you on how we achieve this by, by the three different uh, uh, parts of the injunction. But what we aim to achieve is that the respondent stops using the information uh, and that it should in any case not have had from the beginning. Um, and it is worth reiterating at this juncture that the respondent itself confirmed this. It confirmed this in writing in the document that I took you on to earlier, uh, that it wouldn't uh, obtain such confidential information. So it, it, fo it follows in our submission that the respondent will not suffer any material harm because it itself already confirmed uh, what uh, we are asking for in effect. Um, of course, uh, it then went on to breach its own confirmation, but that is that is a, a separate matter to, to the harm being suffered. Um, and uh, also important for the purposes of balance of convenience is that uh, while there is already very significant harm that has been um, that has been. Um, suffered by the applicant over the last few months uh, since clients have started leaving in troughs, there is still very significant damage that can be suffered. So this is something that we've set out at J JW at paragraph 58. Um, and in essence, um, where we are referring to there to uh, the amounts that have been managed by the particular former employees. So we've said that so far 43 million have moved, um, whereas 157 million still remain of amounts that were managed by these exact four employees. So these are all um, uh, uh, clients to which the former employees would have had access to. Um, we, of course, only have very limited evidence at the moment, which mostly has come into the applicant's hands by accident with respect to you know, where employees have left and for what reason. Um, so we don't know exactly as to how uh, the former employees and respondents are going ahead with uh, contacting these clients. But the fact is that less than a quarter have so far uh, moved. I mean, so the less of the quarter is the full number of clients that have moved, out of which uh, I think so the, the number is, uh, I think, just over 90 clients have moved, out of which only 10 uh, the applicant knows for sure have moved to GSP. So of course that is all that is all to be established. There may well be some that have moved to others or for other reasons, and the applicant has no way of knowing this at this stage. Um, so that's that's important for the balance of convenience, and uh, and the other very important point is of course the undertaking. So as you will have, uh, as your honour will have seen uh, in the draft order, the uh, applicant is willing to provide a cross undertaking in damages. Um, as set out there, which of course, as your honor will also be very familiar, is, is, is an important consideration. Um, so th that uh, probably doesn't conclude everything I want to say on balance of convenience, because I think balance of convenience comes in again under my uh, points six and seven, which uh, relate to why this is without notice and why this is urgent. Uh, so if that's okay, I will talk about these procedural aspects and, you know, and come back to balance of convenience when we talk about urgency, um, because uh, that also answers, I think, your honest question from uh, earlier this morning. Um, so very briefly on why the application is without notice. Uh, we have uh, set the, this out in the JW at paragraph 64, but there are two primary objectives for the application. Uh, the first one is that the applicant stops using the confidential information. And in light of all the evidence that we have already obtained and, and the conduct point that I mentioned to your honor earlier, um, it is the applicant's view that if notice is provided, the respondent may well use the time after the granting of the injunction to go ahead and accelerate contacting uh, remaining clients. Mm -hmm. It appears that so far at least three quarters, more than three quarters, have either not been contacted or have not you know, moved um, and it does appear that notice would uh, may cause, in light of the evidence so far, an acceleration of this, um, uh, of this, which is of course the main reason why we wish to uh, obtain the injunction and prevent the further loss that that comes from this. Uh, and the second reason is also with respect to the deletion uh, aspect. We have uh, for the, in the in the draft order included a 
requirement that electronic uh, evidence is not deleted. This is, of course, purely for preservation purposes in terms of the Part 7 proceedings. Um, and uh, again, in light of the previous conduct where, and we pointed some of this out in JW, uh, again, at paragraph 65, we have pointed out the examples where a respondent has gone ahead and deleted information, for example, from its website, um, or uh, where it uh, set up the anonymous email address. So again, in light of these kind of actions, we do consider that there's a serious ground um, for or to believe that notice would uh, prevent the effectiveness of the injunction. And that's uh, for, for those two primary reasons uh, we have applied without notice. Um, and then my final point seven before getting to the order is uh, urgency. And as I say, I will come back to balance of convenience here. Um, the application is urgent uh, because, as I say, the applicant uh, still has at least three quarters of uh, clients that could be lost. In fact, the three quarters number is um, is conservative because uh, I, I understand uh, in the written as evidence of some in-stone, uh, um, apologies, I don't have the reference, but in some in-stone statement it says that the former employees may have had access to other clients as well. So we don't, in fact, know whether they only have taken their own clients or whether they may have taken information from other clients of the applicant as well. So, in fact, the free quarters number may be conservative. But even on that number, there's a very significant amount of clients that um, that may uh, move and cause the damage that I've addressed, uh, Your Honor, on earlier. Um, we, in response, to your question, um, there is some evidence, as we have uh, put, we have put all the evidence um, that is available in front of Your Honor as part of the witness statements. There is um, some evidence in uh, late April, as well as in May 2023, uh, that uh, clients uh, started moving, some clients, a sm very small number at that point, and I think there were one or two emails that are, that are in evidence uh, from that period, which uh, raised suspicions to the uh, applicant with respect to the confidential information being used and also especially the respondents conduct as part of this. But um, it is in the applicant's evidence, uh, and this is also set out at Mr. Sam Inston's um, witness statement, it is only really the 7th of June email, which I showed to your honor earlier, which is the unequivocal confirmation from the perspective of the applicant that it is not just some confidential information being used, but that there is an AES report that appears to have been taken, that is, a P, that is being copied to a client, that is being used uh, with comparison data of the respondent itself, itself um, and, uh, uh, and that, that was the email at which point the applicant uh, uh, was confident that there, there, is, there is something, uh, there is, there, that, that, that the respondent has done something wrong. To be clear, at this point, the applicant has not instructed us, so the applicant had no legal advice with respect to what the respondent had done wrong. It was simply the applicant's position at this point that clearly there must be some claim here against the respondent, following which uh, the applicant then um, uh, went ahead to obtain legal advice. Um, and of course, since that point, um, more evidence has arisen that uh, he's giving grounds to this injunction application. So between mid-June to mid-August, uh, there was additional evidence which is set out at JJW at um, uh, paragraphs 160 to 161. Um, there's, for example, uh, yet another client that has confirmed that is moving in August, 18th of August 2023, so very recently. Um, and the updated figures of all the clients that have moved are set out at JJW at paragraph 68.5, um, where this is as of last week. The applicant considers that 10 clients have definitively moved to the respondent, 60 very likely, 23 have possibly moved, and six have been affected by the actions. So, so this is the current uh, state um, uh, with respect to the urgency. And as such, um, while the applicant, applicant had suspicions prior to this date, um, applicant may have been particularly cautious here. Um, and... Uh, considered that it was only really when the 7th of June email came in that it had sufficient evidence to go after the respondent. Um, so this, uh, with the other point I wanted to make here is that it's not a case against the former employees. So we do ourselves here 
many of the cases that I that are going to of covenants are being enforced against particular employees. And there, of course, urgency uh, is, in our view, uh, somewhat more important because often the covenants only apply for six or nine months um, and um, the effectiveness of those covenants may be lost uh, if uh, there is delay. In our view, uh, in our situation here, uh, this is, uh, first of all, a much more difficult case than a contractual dispute. It is a tortious claim against uh, the respondent rather than the former employees, and hence establishing that um, and uh, identifying the legal basis, et cetera, is not as straightforward and obviously was, for that reason, not immediately apparent to the uh, lay applicant um, prior to engaging counsel. Um, uh, but uh, it, it also means that um, uh, th there was some time that was needed to uh, identify the evidence against the respondent in particular. But the main point is that none of this makes any difference because uh, at the end of the day, the obligation on the former employees to keep confidential information confidential uh, does not have a, a time limit. Um, of course, at some point, the confidential information will lose its confidential character. We are clearly nowhere near that because the information that they're using is still accurate. Um, but um, there is no particular time limit uh, to which there was the former employees were sort of tied with respect to the confidential information. And that, uh, in our view, comes uh, into the urgency and balance of convenience um, assessment that uh, your honor will need to undertake. Um, and goes back to the point I made already. While some harm, very significant harm, has been suffered, there's much more significant harm that can continue to be suffered. Um, and we expect, of course, again, in full frank disclosure, we've identified this in the witness statement, we expect that the respondent will strongly disagree, uh, will will disagree on the issue of urgency. Uh, Your Honor already um, uh, noted this at the uh, beginning um, of the case. Um, we, we say the respondent may wish to rely on Gemini and Julian Sawyer. We, we may wish to rely on that as well. Gemini and Julian Sawyer, Sawyer which will be in your bundle. Uh, and that will be at uh, page uh, 593 of the bundle. It was held there that the point at which a party needs to act, uh, and I'm saying here with respect to an injunction, uh, is the point at which a breach occurs. So it, it is uh, in the applicant's uh, position, it is really the 7th of June email which confirmed the breach, um, uh, following which obviously the basis, et cetera, and the evidence had to be established. So that's uh, that, that, that's our, our view on um, when, when the breach occurred. Um, and um, I also wanted to, I apologize, this is a case that we have not included in the hearing bundle, but I did want to raise this to your attention if possible. Maybe we can add it. It's the Law Society of England uh, and Wales versus uh, Society of Lawyers a case. Um, 1996 FSR 739 in the High Court Chancery Division, judgment by Mr. Justice Reimer, is a very relevant case that goes to the issue of urgency. Um, and then there the question uh, should consider uh, on the basis of our analysis of that case is uh, what is the impact of any delay? And this is, I think, where I wanted to kind of go back to the balance of convenience. Um, the precedents, and not just this one, but also okay. precedents that are in the bundle show that delay itself is not determinative of an injunction. Uh, there's no uh, requirement under the law or case law which says that an injunction needs to be requested in a particular period of time. Instead, the case, the case law mandates that uh, the issue is fact-sensitive. Uh, and the issue of delay in my submission needs to be considered from the balance of convenience because uh, if any delay occurred, it does not impact that balance. And what I mean here is um, the new status quo that may have developed after the respondent breached its obligations and started using the applicant's confidential information appears, I mean, now we know, appears to have uh, happened probably from end April, certainly May. Uh, that, that must be when the respondent started contacting various clients because on the 7th of June, we know as a fact that one of the clients has now left and uh, confirmed on the basis on which it, it has left. So from around uh, April, and obviously we do have some evidence in April, in the 27th of April, I think a first uh, piece of evidence where which suggests that there is something wrong. 
Uh, we have some evidence uh, from that period that basically the status quo has been changed. From that point, the respondent has reached out to certain clients using our information. Um, and uh, th that's, th that status quo has now persisted and will persist because that's, that's the position from which the balance of convenience needs to be considered. So while requesting the respondent to stop uh, using our information will inevitably cause some inconvenience to the respondent because, of course, they have already used it, uh, possibly even some embarrassment. Um, it will not cause anything as compared to the harm and damage that it's causing to the applicant, nor will that cause any more embarrassment or inconvenience than it would have caused three months ago or two months ago or whenever earlier the respondent will argue this should have been filed. The position would have been the same since the moment the respondent sent emails to its clients using uh, the applicant's confidential information. So we say that the balance of convenience does not shift at all, whether we're finding this today or in a month's time or a month previously. And that uh, concludes my submissions on the seven points. And uh, subject to any questions, I could would then move to the draft order to talk <coughs> to tell to, to, to take your honor through uh, each of the requests that we have made. Well, let's just try and get the dates of this clear. The all four employees resign on the 25th of July of last year. Uh, Correct. <laughs> It's unclear to me, despite what appears in Schedule C, uh, as to the dates when the employment of each of the four individuals actually ended. Indeed, there seems to be some dispute about that and when they first began with uh, GSB. Uh, can you help me on that? Um, so the uh, employment, yes, the employment did end. We have set this out in the draft order at Schedule C. That, that those are the dates when the employment ended. But you're absolutely, your honour is absolutely right that because of the labour disputes that continued under the UAE labour law and both parties had claims against each other and those, uh, and we are not representing um, the uh, applicant in these proceedings. But because of those proceedings, I understand uh, those proceedings would have impacted uh, exactly when what was allowed, because um, as we referred you earlier to the labour law, the labour law restricts certain movements while proceedings are ongoing. Um, so, uh, do do uh, I, do we know? I'm not sure. We know exactly when they started officially work at GSB. Um, well, when, when? <clears throat> yes, go on. Tell me. Oh, sorry, apologies. I'm being I'm being referred to the witness statement of Sam Instone at paragraph 49. Yeah. Um, when it assesses it's difficult to establish exactly when each of the former employees commenced work. But oh, um, Mr. Instone, yeah, sorry. But when did they cease work? The, when the, did they the, leave, leave the employment? Of the, 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 uh, Yes, those dates are set out uh, in the Schedule C. Uh, are they also yeah, in the same? And the, those are September, October, and August 22. Yeah, they're not not supported in the witness statements, so far as I can see. But the, the only relevance of that being that uh, if there's a three month or six month prohibition on competition, uh, I think it's six months, isn't it, in each of the contracts? Yeah. yeah. So that, that that has long since expired, but you say, well, of course, that doesn't impact on the use of confidential information, which is a Yes, that's exactly portion. right. That's exactly right, but, which is why uh, there are no claims under the restrictive covenants against the former employees yeah, yeah. because they appear to have waited. Uh, and I mean, again, this is purely yeah. circumstantial at this stage, but that appears to be what happened. Yes, I mean, the probability is that they waited the six months and then used the confidential information in approaching uh, your the claimant's clients. That yeah. is our All understanding, right. yes. Yeah. yeah, well, that would appear to make sense. All right, uh, understood. Um, uh, I, by the way, I've, I've got the bundle now and I've got the skeleton. It's been sent through to me, so I, I will look at that in, in just a moment. Uh, Thank you. It, let, let's, let's look at the form of order 
uh, and tell me uh, how it hangs Excellent. together. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so the the order, the draft order, uh, will be in your hearing bundle at uh, section A at item three. Um, yeah. And um, I also have it under me. So um, there are a few uncontroversial aspects. Let me start with those. Um, of course, um, uh, the draft order includes the penal notice. Um, it provides at um, item one, uh, paragraph one, for return date. We have for the time being pro 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 suggested for 14 days, but we are, of course, uh, in your honor's hands, and we appreciate that the uh, may uh, attempt to agree a different date. We have for the time being included one hour uh, time estimates, but um, we are also in your hands that this respect, because if uh, Yona considers that we need some more time, we can uh, incorporate this. Uh, it does appear to us that it is a sufficiently straightforward matter, which is why we've included the one hour. So this is point number one. Uh, well, it, it's, either, it's, either going to be a, it's either going to be a hearing where um, directions are given for a, a large inter partes uh, application to be dealt with, um, or, or else it'll um, uh, simply go on the nod, so to speak. Uh, it's a bit hard to see um, how, um, and it's either going to be a very long application because the defendant turns up and uh, uh, has lots of evidence as to why what he's doing is uh, all justifiable, um, or it'll be a directions hearing um, or a simple continuation. So I think probably one hour is likely to be sufficient. But going back for a moment to the penal notice, the penal notices uh, can't be can't be right because you can't imprison the company. Um, so your penal notice ought to read: if you disobey this order, you may be found guilty of contempt of court, and you may be fined or have your assets seized, uh, <clears throat> or your directors may be subject to uh, imprisonment, mm -hmm. a fine, or seizure of assets. All right. So thank you so much. You need need yes. the appropriate form for a company. Yes, our apologies for this. Um, uh, we will. Uh, would it make You're sense, Fiona, if we updated the order yes. as we speak now, and then we provide an updated one? Yeah, yeah. For your consideration. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. And um, you're probably aware there's a, a debate as to whether or not uh, the penal notice and the DIFC should take the form that it does in the UK because. Um, the, the reference is simply to the Attorney General in the, or, or to the authorities uh, in the DIFC in relation to any question of imprisonment. The court doesn't have power to impose imprisonment. Um, but I always take the view that as long as the words used are you may be sent to prison, that's OK, even though the process is different from that which would occur in most common law jurisdictions. I understand. Uh, you Thank you very appreciate much. That that the court itself doesn't have power to, this court being a civil court doesn't have any power to impose imprisonment at all yes, it has absolutely. to go elsewhere yes no no absolutely yeah. and i think we are aware of one example of a contempt um application yeah, yeah. before oh. the dfc court but but yes we know that's very helpful um we will take that oh, yes, on board. It, it happens don't worry it happens we can find uh, a someone to be in contempt the only point is that you can't do the imprisonment it has to go through the authorities appropriate authorities and they have to make decisions about imprisonment no, thank, anyway, thank you on, very much on, on, on we go and I'm, I'm more concerned about the yes the substantive orders yes absolutely so moving to the substantive orders uh two three and four which we do say uh go hand in hand um, so number two is the um, sort of more vanilla request uh, not yeah. to use our confidential information. So we do think yeah. that that's a very basic request on the basis of uh, what yeah. we've discussed already, which can be made out. It refers to confidential information, which is set out in um, a Schedule C in some detail, um, including um, uh, with respect to the particular employees and what they would have brought with them, um, and it uses uh, sort of a typical language one would expect in this kind of uh, in this kind of case. So, um, unless your honour has any questions about two, I would move to three and four. Well, um, I was just looking at Schedule C as compared with what's actually referred to in Mr. Instone's uh, witness statement. 
Um, <clears throat> He, he refers uh, paragraph 68 to uh, client lists and data pertaining to charging structures and so on. Is, is that all uh, adequately covered in Schedule C? It's all very general. Yes. Schedule C, I just wondered if there ought not to be a specific reference to the client list, which is the obvious. Um, uh. Yes, thank you very much, Yona. If that's uh, that is something, that, yeah, it says uh, I think including lists of clients is that right. uh, okay. in row in in, uh, in line four under one B of Schedule C, it says business contacts including lists of clients with a previous existing Sorry. or prospective. Uh, but we could we could move that further up to make it clearer. Well, it's, I think it's just a question of you being clear that you've included what Mr. Instone refers to at paragraph 68.1 and 68.3. Yes, absolutely. We, we will double check one more time, but um, that was our intention. Well, I'm going, I'm going to ask you to submit an, a revised order in, in any event uh, during which which whilst you do that, I'll read the, the skeleton and make sure I haven't missed anything from your submissions in any event. But Thank yes, you. OK, let's uh, obviously that that's the basic um, form of injunction that's appropriate on an, uh, an ex parte basis, not to use the yes. materials. That That's fine. Um, yes. The, then tell, the, the tell me. Yes. Yeah. Go on. Apologies. Uh, the preservation order we, we we say also goes hand in hand with the primary objective because uh, simply because there's of course going to be part seven merits proceeding um, during which a final injunction is going to be requested and um, it, it, the respondent should not delete, destroy, or interfere with the electronic evidence purely for that purpose, including metadata, which is what we've included here, um, uh, yeah. purely for purposes of disclosure. So again, we do think that that is another. Uh, vanilla aspect of this order. Um, so, and I think you've already indicated that uh, the the part of the order that you would like me to um, address you on is the delivery up order. So, and if you don't have any comments on item three, we can move to item four. Well, the, the point point is this: that one and two, um, I understand, of course, the need for urgency and also the need for that to be uh, ex parte, but for uh, delivery up, which is a positive mandatory injunction. Uh, however clear the case is, one would ordinarily expect that to be dealt with on an inter-parties basis, because why, why, what's the justification for it being ex parte? Yes, and we, are, we will be, of course, um, very much uh, uh, in your hands as to how you decide, and we are certainly comfortable to introduce the delivery up order in the uh, following the reserve date. Well, why we have introduced it at this stage, and we have for the time being kept the date um, uh, open because we did want to um, uh, address you on this issue. Um, so we have not included at this stage when the delivery up order would be made, um, because to some extent um, it, it does depend uh, on on the on the return date, I guess, and on well whether the respondent will participate, as you, as you've suggested, uh, as your honour suggested earlier. The issue with the delivery of upward and why we think it is important in this case um, is because in our submission, it goes hand in hand in here with the uh, two orders under items two and three. And why do we say that? Um, that's because um, it's only really the delivery up order, uh, which obviously needs to be read together with paragraph five, which is the witness statement, which confirms oh. that the delivery up order was complied with. Um, it is only these two orders that uh, will uh, ensure that the respondent complies with the second and third order. That's our reasoning for including the delivery up order at this stage, because in light of what we've seen from the respondent so far, the respondent covers up uh, its tracks, it deletes information from website, and creates uh, new entities to um, uh, give employment when it may not be able to um, and in those circumstances, uh, we are concerned that if delivery up order is not included uh, either now um, or at a later stage, there is a real risk that the order will be ineffective because the respondent will not 
have gone to the um, exercise of drafting a witness statement, identifying what are the documents that it has received that it shouldn't have, returning these documents for uh, safekeeping for escrow with the solicitors until the end of the uh, dispute, and thereby, um, thereby, uh, uh, to some extent, crystallizing w w what it will be doing under uh, under uh, paragraph two, where it's where it shouldn't be using that information. Um, so that's uh, so the delivery app order in this particular situation is uh, really uh, the conduct points and the authority in the Catania that we sort of cited earlier. I just don't understand how this works, uh, Ms. Burke, because you, you want them to preserve the uh, the documents or re records that they've got uh, uh, on the one so, hand, and, and yet you want them to live up the confidential information uh, on the other. Well, obviously, uh, you, you need preservation of records if you're going to claim damages in due course. Um, but if we're talking about delivery up of hard copies is one thing, but everything else is uh, is electronic anyway. All these lists will be electronic. All the information will be electronic. Uh, and um, in those situations, to deliver you up copies isn't going to help. Uh, and the question is, you know, if you, you don't want the, them to destroy the electronic copies they've got, um, th this isn't going to help you at all. The, the, the order that they are not to use it, of course, binds regardless whether they hand over copies or not. Uh, but, but I don't understand how delivery up uh, of uh, soft copy it, it is going to work alongside preservation. Yes, uh, so we, we had partly anticipated this in the sense that the delivery app order includes both hard copies and electronic copies, whereas the preservation yeah. order only refers to electronic copies because that's uh, because the assumption here is that any hard copies would by that point uh, have gone. And that was another reason for the delivery app order because at least the, the client's information, uh, which is in hard copy, would have uh, by that point been returned and can no longer be used. Uh, and therefore, it would to some extent be within the applicant's control um, rather than uh, the respondent. So there is that benefit, but there is, uh, and in terms of the electronic documents, and as your honor uh, and rightly noted, of course, majority will be electronic. The suggestion here it'll, is that the- It will be. It'll nearly all be electronic, won't it? it, it your honor is probably right, <laughs> probably right on this point. Uh, in terms of the electronic documents, what our thinking was that uh, the electronic documents, first of all, the delivery app order will make the respondent identify all of them because the respondent will have to uh, issue a witness statement uh, verifying what was done. So that is an important step um, in light of the respondent's conduct in our view. Um, uh, it will then provide these electronic documents for outside keeping uh, in the sense that uh, it will be clear what it is uh, that has been taken and that has been used. Um, and in its own records, that's um, preservation order under number three, which is purely uh, for future disclosure purposes uh, and uh, evidence uh, preservation purposes. And also, of course, in case something is missed, because you know we, uh, there's a certainly a possibility that the delivery up order, uh, at least initially, may miss some information uh, inadvertently. Um, um, it, it may be missed, but then later it, it may be identified that some additional information has been obtained electronically. So that, that was the logic of how these two worked. In terms of the timing, um, I, I'm wondering, and uh, sort of I'm uh, just sort of uh, just wondering here on the spot now, whether rather than um, including a delivery up order with a particular date now, it is possible to include a delivery up order at this stage, which only bides, uh, let's say, two weeks after, uh, you know, a, a return date or any particular hearing. Um, so that the so that the respondent is aware that following the interpartis application, there is going to be a request for delivery up, and at least on the on on the current ex parte basis, your honour uh, considers that it is a, a, a reasonable request that should be granted, uh, but it doesn't come to bite um, until that date. Because my concern is that if we exclude it entirely right now. Um, as I say, it goes back to my previous point. Uh, to some extent, the respondent will be um, left uh, with too much responsibility with respect to paragraph two um, of sort of, you know, not using information that uh, there will be no effort uh, or no particular effort requested, at least not in this order, 
of identifying what that information entails. Um, so we do think that it is important to include it, uh, but if your honor is minded to include it, potentially include the, the date of delivery um, as after the return date. Well, in order to police the uh, non-use of information under paragraph two, I understand that you need to have copies of the confidential information that uh, has um, they already have in their possession. And, and delivery up, uh, provided there's a good arguable case as to uh, confidential information being taken and used, which there plainly is, um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have an order for delivery up of copies. Um, <clears throat> I, I think th I, I think what, what ought to be done is that paragraph 4.2 ought simply to make it clear uh, that it is the provision of copies of all the confidential information that they have, uh, rather than because it doesn't sit together with destruction of the soft copies in paragraph three. You can't have both, it seems to me. On the one hand, you want to know yes. what he's got. Yes. I understand that. On the other hand, you don't want him to destroy uh, everything uh, yes. because you want to claim damages in due course. I've got yes, that right, yeah. haven't I? I've not, not misunderstood the position. No, that's exactly right, Your Honor, and apologies. To you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What's missing in 4.2 is that it is copies that are requested. Exactly right. Right, so it's copies of all confidential and confidential information uh, as set out in Schedule 2, which is an electronic format. That's what you want. But you want him to actually retain what else he's got, and then disclosure in due course will reveal whether uh, he's done all that he should have done in providing you with uh, uh, and, and what's what, what use has been made of it. Uh, I mean, you know, taking the client list, for example, um, in disclosure in due course, uh, there will be um, obviously correspondence uh, with the people concerned, but you would also be able to see how often the list has been referred to in order to make those contacts. Um, Absolutely. I'm glad this presents a, a difficulty self-evidently because after the six month period, uh, the uh, employees will remember who some of the clients are without reference to the client list. I mean, that's just life. Uh, and yep. um, an approach after the end of the period then becomes um, potentially justifiable. Um, would you like to think about that and, and change the form of the order? I, I, I I think delivery up uh, of copies is certainly um, appropriate on an ex parte basis where it's confidential information they shouldn't have at all in the first place. It's just the interrelationship of that with paragraph three that troubles me. Thank all you. Right? Thank you very much. We will do that. And in terms of your consideration that it is appropriate, uh, the date for the well, delivery the up. How, how, how quickly can, can that reasonably be done? Yes, if they're providing yes. copies. Uh, I mean, and it, of course, some... they're providing a witness statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something like seven days is, seems to me to be about right, but um, it gives them an adequate chance to do the job and do the job properly. Uh, the difficulty is to know exactly what information they've got. Um, yes. the, the, the oddity about this case is that if you go back to um, the time when uh, they, they handed in their resignations uh, and the time of the uh, interviews and um, investigation interviews which took place, um, the claimant was well aware that the four employees had in fact uh, downloaded and taken uh, in confidential information. What of course wasn't plain was how it was going to be used. Um, <laughs> But the question really is exactly what that information consists of, how much material there is, and therefore how easy it is for that to be um, produced by way of copy. But I can't think that um, there'd be any difficulty in doing that within seven days. Is, is, what, is what appears at Mr. Instone's paragraph 66 
the uh, most uh, informative material as to what they've actually got. Uh, 68, paragraph 68 as well of Mr. Instance. Uh, I meant 68. 68. I meant 68. Yeah, 66 yes. and 68 will be the, yeah, the longest uh, uh, evidence, a piece of evidence uh, relating to the information that is suspected. And Your Honour is absolutely right uh, with respect to the former employees' uh, breaches, and those have been pursued yeah. since last year in UAE proceedings. Yeah. It is really just the respondents' uh, breaches and involvement that wasn't clear until this year. I, I follow that. The question is what the respondents have got. Uh, the respondents now employing these individuals, they, they will have access to everything that these individuals have. Yeah on their yes. own computers, no doubt, uh, or indeed on computers that uh, are in the name of um, the uh, separate entity that's been set up in order to, to um, make advances and so on. Um, all right, well, yes. you have a think about that, uh, uh, but you. I think seven, day, seven days, particularly if there's going to be a, a, a witness statement verified uh, by uh, verifying a full and complete delivery up and so on and so forth. Um, yes. I'm entirely satisfied that this is an appropriate case for uh, an ex parte uh, interim injunction. Uh, there is plainly a serious issue to be, be tried. In fact, there's a compelling case as to the removal of confidential information and as to its use, at least to some extent, uh, by the um, uh, respondent. Uh, the balance of convenience or balance of prejudice, as it's often called, uh, uh, undoubtedly weighs in favour of the grant of such uh, an injunction uh, in relation to confidential information, uh, which should never have been removed from the claimant and should certainly not be uh, in the hands of or under the control of uh, the uh, defendants, uh, quite apart from the for ex employees. Um, in those circumstances, I'm satisfied that uh, an order should be made of the kind that is set out, but the details of the drafting um, are to be the subject of um, a further submission uh, by the claimant, during which time I shall just make sure that I have taken on board all the points uh, because uh, of the absence of some documentation at the time the hearing began, all of which I now have uh, in my possession. Um, what else do you need at this stage? If you go away and redraft this uh, and send something to me in the course of the next half hour or so, uh, then... Yes, absolutely. The only other point I had was about service, I think. Oh, there were two, sorry, there were two more points. One is about... Um, the undertaking in damages, uh, often, as you will know, security of some kind is required in relation to any undertaking in damages. Uh, I'm unclear from what is said by uh, Mr. Instone at paragraph 95 as to what is meant by um, <clears throat> a balance sheet in excess of 7.5 million pounds sterling across the AES group. Uh, there are no details given of the structure of the AES group uh, as compared with the claimant, which is AES Middle East Insurance Broker LLC. So an undertaking by the claimant company uh, is um, only good so far as the assets of the claimant company are concerned. And I don't have any information about that as opposed to the group itself. Do you see that? Paragraph yes, I 95. do see that issue. Yes, absolutely. I, I Thank do. you, Your Honour. Yes. I'd um, like to know a little, little bit more about the substance of the AES company or whether an undertaking is being given by the AES group, and if so, what the AES group is. Um, but it, what's being talked about is the net revenue of the group as a whole. I understand else from elsewhere in the witness statement that there is both a UK company uh, and a um, 
uh, a DIFC company as well. Yes, Jonah, thank you for that comment. That's absolutely right. Um, the UAE, I'm looking, uh, yes. It's paragraph three of Ms. Stonestone, paragraph three and paragraph 95 are the two relevant paragraphs. <clears throat> And yes, it's hard uh, to it's it's hard to see what the what the damages would be from in any event if the injunction were wrongly granted in relation to the use of this uh, uh, information uh, when they've got the opportunity to come back before the court uh, in two weeks' time in any event. Uh, but I need to be satisfied that when you're talking about a balance sheet, um, presumably that's net assets of 7.5 million, uh, that that's referable to the claimant or at least to those who are offering undertakings. And it may be your, all three companies will have to offer undertakings. Yes, um, well, no, thank you. I will I will double check. I mean, the UAE entity uh, is the relevant entity and it has the, the uh, any necessary assets. So I appreciate the confusion on, on the evidence. Um, so. The, uh, well, I will you double may, check this point. Uh, you may you need to not, not only double check it, but um, you, you will need to submit with the draft order uh, a statement on instructions as to what the assets of the companies are that are giving the undertakings, uh, and uh, that can be that can be verified in due course by a further witness statement um, as required. Thank you for the direction. Absolutely, we can do that. Um, and as as Joanna also says, that to some extent we haven't offered security here because it, it is in our view uh, that there really uh, well, shouldn't I, be any damage at all uh, to the respondent. Um, I'm not yeah, I'm not seeking is. security, but I am seeking yeah. to know the substance of those who are giving the undertakings. That's well noted. No. Thank you. And the other only other point I had related to to the question of service. Um. Yes, I mean, it, it, and again, we are in your hands, Your Honour, if uh, we should serve the um, respondent uh, as DFC office in person, that is also acceptable. We generally, um, uh, obviously, the parties have already corresponded via email. And obviously, email is nowadays the accepted uh, correspondence method for most parties, which is why we have included here a request uh, for your honest um, uh, permission to serve uh, the respondent by email. Uh, but if that is at all problematic, we can change that to a, 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 the typical uh, service. That ought to be both notification straight away by email once the injunction is granted, but there ought to be service in the ordinary uh, manner, uh, according to the rules, both both are required. Notification by email and then service in accordance with uh, the, the rules. Um, that becomes necessary uh, because of any questions of contempt, unless there's proper service, uh, the contempt application won't even run. Thank you very much for the directions. We shall amend this uh, on that basis. Okay. So, so that that would change the paragraph seven of Schedule A. Service yes. will be deemed to have taken place the day after the email is sent. It, it it'll be um, in accordance with the rules of court. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else that you want to raise at this stage? No, thank you. That's all from our side, and thank you very much for taking the time to consider the matter. Um, uh, in the time that you uh, produce a new draft, uh, which you uh, please send to the court and they will forward to me for approval. Um, I will look at the other material to make sure that I haven't uh, uh, missed anything. The other question is the return date. What do you want to do about that? Um, you've said no later than 14 days. You just look at my diary to see what that looks like. Thank you.
we're providing seven days for the affidavits and so on and delivery up, which takes us to, let's assume you get this out, or well, let's say tomorrow, just to be on the safe side, that would take us to the seventh, so that we're looking at something in the following week. Well, I, I, as matters stand, I could do Thursday the 14th of September. So shall we say uh, return date 14th September? Um, of course, if the parties want to um, adjourn that to a different date, that's that's that will be OK with the injunctions continuing. But let's work on the 14th of September as the return date. Thank you very right. much. And shall we put the time in as well as uh, same time at 12 uh, GST, 9 a.m. Uh, English time? Uh, yes, let's do that. Thank you very much. We will update that. All, all right. Um, very good. And if, I say, you, you send the, the draft, I, I want to see the draft claim form too. Uh, if that's now in uh, proper form, um, you can submit that at the same time as the draft order. Uh, and I'll uh, have a look at you. that at the, at the same time. Um, Yes, thank and you I very much. That, I think I'm, that, I'm hearing that we should be able to do both very quickly, so we'll do this immediately. Yeah. Very, very good. All right. Uh, uh, excellent. Uh, and then the the as I say, the court will forward it to me for approval, and um, we should get it back to you uh, within a matter of um, of, of minutes if, uh, of of um, or sending them through. All right. Um, if you wouldn't mind then uh, signing off and leaving me to have a word with the court associate, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.